Black Ops Cold War is a surprisingly controversial game. Either it's the most underrated Call of Duty released in a decade, or it's the epitome of everything wrong with modern COD titles, and I think it's interesting to explore its legacy now that we're a few years removed from the launch. I'm only going to be covering the Zombies mode today in this video because otherwise the video would be an extra 45 minutes to an hour long, and I'm mostly a Zombies expert at heart. This is the third video in my retrospective series on the Call of Duty games, and these take a lot of time for me to make, so let's get the general YouTuber things out of the way. Likes appreciated and reaching 4,000 on this video would be amazing because it's the longest video I have ever made. Also, subscribing is appreciated and comment where you fall in the heated debate over Cold War's legacy. Is it a good game? Is it a bad game? Or do you fall somewhere in between? I'm going to skip pretty much everything before launch on Cold War because a lot of it was just small teasers and yes, there was one big thing, but I will get to that later. On launch day for Cold War though, there was just one zombies map named D Machine which also serves as the beginning of what became the Dark storyline. It's a sort of loose tie-in to the original Ether story that you're probably familiar with that ran from World of War until the end of Black Ops 4. There are characters who appear in both stories, but they aren't really the same people. The Machine is a partial remake of Noctar and Toten with a lot more flavor actually added to it. As we begin the game though, we are tasked with picking a loadout similar to multiplayer or Warzone. This has been trimmed down though just to include your starting weapon and the new addition of the field upgrades. This is a similar concept to Black Ops 4 for specialist abilities and zombies. And on that launch day, there was a few of them. First of all was Ring of Fire, which made a fire ring around you, and if stood inside would give the player a damage boost. Frost Blast was a powerful ice wave that killed or stunned anything within a few feet of you. Energy mines were mostly similar to that, but took a bit longer to activate and could be aimed away from the player. Ether Shroud allowed you to go invisible for a few seconds, and Healing Aura helped you and your team regain health quickly if stood near where it was activated. Each of these individually served their own unique purposes and none of them really felt entirely useless. Once a few rounds in the starting room had passed, you would then enter the Nocturne Totem building and subsequently enter that to go into an area where Juggernaug is already turned on and can be bought right away. One big change that you will be hearing very early on in this game is that your character aside from being exceptionally cringe is not very important. Anything major going on will be told to you through a radio system by different characters. And what those characters will very quickly tell you is that the Nazis during World War II used this area as a research site to enter new dimensions and the Russians took it over once the war had ended. This is the source of the global zombie outbreak that we are here to fix. This design change to have characters that we know from the campaign and multiplayer explain everything was likely made to help integrate people from Warzone which was on top of the world at this point in time. My assumption was that Activision wanted to let those players continue to use their skins that they paid $20 for and were familiar with but was still able to tell the story without too many interruptions. Personally, I didn't mind this so much for Cold War in particular because it made sense for that very specific purpose, but to so, so, so many other people, they were very not happy with this decision. A lot of people, justifiably so, felt that Cherik had betrayed them and the stories that they had been telling for a decade through a set crew that we went through trials and tribulations with map after map. Again, I don't think that the decision was so deep, and I think it was just Activision trying to streamline the character process between all the modes and just letting Timmy have his rosé skin in zombies as well. But going back to the gameplay, now that we've got Juggernaug and it's time to go down into this spooky bunker that's dark and we're going to need a flashlight on our gun to navigate through. While you're opening all these doors, you'll probably encounter some weird stuff dropping from the zombies and that's called salvage. This is Cold War's extra new currency that is used in only a few but very important ways. With this new salvage, you can do stuff like buying items from the crafting table where there are grenades Aids, kill streaks, which is just crazy to see in zombies, and self revives because quick revive no longer revives the player in solo matches. You can actually buy unlimited self revives, and that was a really big debate on launch if that should be nerfed or not. Players were reaching round 200 with like 30 downs, and some older fans were very local in their opinion to have that change. Salvage is also used to buy and upgrade armor, which is similar to a system that we saw in World War II zombies. And lastly, it can be used to upgrade your gun's rarity, which is basically just a damage boost. That that isn't from pack punching. Hey, now that the power is on, we can see that in this room there's a giant damage particle accelerator, and it happens to create a portal we can enter that brings us briefly 
directly to the Dark Aether Dimension. It's a world that is similar to ours in some ways, but also houses a lot of evil as we will find out, and is purple and has flying jellyfish. I'll explain more about it as we go along in these maps though. Our ultimate goal of entering this dimension for right now though is to find a part for what turns out to be the pack punch machine. It's like seeing an old friend again. The only thing left to do now is to get the wonder weapons which are a mix of old and new. Actually I forgot about you know the big dickhead himself the megaton who is our mid round boss who appears every three to four rounds normally. His biggest threat is that when he gets close to you he'll backhand you out of existence but once his health bar is depleted the megaton actually splits into two more creatures called megaton bombers who are just as strong. Personally I'm not a fan because the bombers are very hard to take down especially when you're camping and his high amount of health later on really is just kind of annoying. He is a nice challenge the first couple of times you see him and I guess that's what Cherik was really going for but anyway for the wonder weapons we have the classic ray gun because no map will be complete without it. I'm looking at you vanguard for the first six months but the ray gun here is actually really good simply because of the round 35 health cab and PhD flopper returning. Literally on day one people figured this out and were off to the races using the ray gun and simply training in the spawning room to reach round 200 very quickly. Then a few days later an even more broken strategy was found with the ring of fire where you barely needed to move and could reach round 500 or 600 before you would crash. This wasn't beta male black ops 3 useless ray gun anymore this was the sigma male steel yo girl ray gun. Eventually it did get slight nerfs with its ammo and damage being slightly reduced but it's still by far the best thing to use in cold war. The machine also has the die shockwave which is probably one of the more unique wonder weapons that we've had in a while. It sucks zombies in to refill its ammo and then can shoot out a big ball of energy that is good but not great. Combined with ring of fire and camping strategies it's really good but that's more of a testament to how brokenly overpowered ring of fire is rather than how good the shockwave is. But I will say that the shockwave does have four upgrades though. First is being the ice upgrade that's not anything special. There's a fart gun upgrade which is more funny than effective. The lightning upgrade is most noteworthy because with either shroud it gives you an insane speed boost faster than you've ever been able to move in zombies. And lastly the fire upgrade is mediocre which it hurts me to say but the base shockwave is actually probably the best. Something you need to upgrade the shockwave for though is the main quest easter egg which is actually pretty good in my opinion. The first few steps just require us to turn on the power and to kill a megaton. Once he's killed he'll drop a part that we place in a weapons locker and now we do a little 30 second quest to get a free die shockwave. Now that we've got that we need to enter a brand new portal that's appeared and find three parts to what's called the ether scope well in the dark ether mode. Once we've crafted that another portal will appear where we can grab a diary from one of the dead scientists who worked at the facility. Once we're back out of an anomaly will appear and the scientist in ghost form appears again and we hand him his own diary. He'll speak for a little while and after doing this in two different locations we're given a computer password to unlock a mechanism in the same room. Then comes the tedious part where even in a solo game all four of the shockwave upgrades need to be built and shot at this large container mechanism. After this we talk to a few different ghosts that explain we need a zombie decontamination device. We whack a tank with a spooky wrench for some reason and it fires knocking down the part that we need. Running them underneath the large container will eventually get them sucked up inside. Now we press a button on the computer from earlier and it will create a friendly megaton. One more ghost interaction and it's boss fight time. The now friendly Megaton will be going around the pack punch room tampering with electronics on the particle accelerator and attempting to make it explode. You just need to keep zombies away from him for a few minutes but the reason why he's helping us is because actually his name is Orlov and this Megaton is actually a Soviet volunteer to enter the facility after it had been closed for decades and reactivate the particle accelerator. While he was doing this he had become mutated but still has the memories of his family and the horrible things that he had to see well inside the facility. Facility, Orlov wants to make amends by helping us and sacrificing himself. Once he's done, the very ground around the map begins to become unstable with beams of energy shooting out everywhere. The whole team needs to parkour around the map very carefully to reach a helicopter that takes us away as the whole map explodes. As I said at the start of the explanation, I really like this main quest as an introduction to the mechanics of Cold War and the new storyline that they were trying to present. Freyrick wanted people to complete this and made it easy enough to do so because Hopefully if they 
did and people listened to the story and found all the cool guns or mechanics or all that other stuff that they would continue to play more in the future. Upgrading all of the shockwave variants as much as I complained about it are easy enough to do but takes up a bit too much of the overall quest for someone who's been playing zombies since 2010 like me. Orlov is a favorite character of mine who actually I feel sorry for once the boss fight begins and makes you feel as if you need to help him. The exit sequence is also really cool and something that they've never tried before so always big ups for that. Overall D Machine was a simple but good zombies map to begin Cold War's year with and clearly others thought the same way that I did. On launch according to Treyarch themselves more people were playing zombies at the time than any other point in history. Considering the marketing hype that went into Black Ops 4 or the lauded legacy of Black Ops 3 I find this absolutely fascinating. Personally I had my best month for views ever on YouTube when it launched despite only uploading like 10 videos and pretty much anyone else who uploaded at the time saw huge numbers as well. There was even people like Tim the Tatman, Courage JD, Admiral Baru, Tfue, Dr. Lupo, and way more huge names playing zombies every day on their streams and in videos for like two weeks straight. That doesn't seem like a lot, but considering these guys usually only play zombies once after they've done multiplayer for a couple days and then never touch it again is actually kind of huge. And them doing that introduced a new audience to zombies that maybe never tried any Call of Duty style besides Warzone or some youngins from Fortnite. It genuinely can be understated how much hype in the first month of Cold War's life there really was. Some people may argue that there was more players because of the pandemic, which is true to an extent, but it was also bringing in a different kind of player than it did in the past. The changes to the core mechanics of zombies making it more in line with multiplayer and Warzone was enticing to those individuals who make up a large portion of Call of Duty's overall player base. This wouldn't be a fair and balanced review though if I didn't talk about the very very vocal group of zombies fans who thought this new game was an absolute travesty. I'll go over some of the main complaints I saw and still see as I go along with the maps for oh, you know just for now let's go over a few of the mechanics and more D machine specific complaints. The major one I saw was about the lack of difficulty. In Cold War the zombies stop gaining health after about round 35 and that means guns like the ray gun, shockwave, or even LMGs like the stoner are really overpowered. Using strategies like camping on the rooftop of the main knocked building you can combine any decently good weapon with a ring of fire and reach round 100 in about 2 hours. After that point the game doesn't really get any more difficult since running out of ammo isn't an issue, zombies can drop ammo and it can also be bought from different ammo chests that are scattered around the map. There's also score streaks which are really good but something like the chopper gunner could kill hundreds of zombies in one use and can be used as a get out of jail free card if you're stuck in a corner. Even if you take it down, unlimited self revives are available from the crafting table and tombstones afterlife of effect can also be a game saver. If you're an above average player with a good strategy and some time on your hands, all difficulty kinda goes out of the window on D-Machine. With this point, I do actually agree with a lot of people, it is too easy to the point where it warps people's sense of how hard other previous zombies games were in comparison. Reaching round 100 on D-Machine is the skill equivalent of round 25 on Black Ops 1. But I also think that that's what Treyarch wanted to happen, making the Raygun that good had to be intentional because it's zombies most iconic weapon that even people who've never heard of it have heard of the ray gun. And as their reward for coming to play this new game and checking out the new story, why not let them experience all the map has to offer including round 100? I don't entirely agree with the strategy, but I do understand it. Another complaint that I see is the lack of a set crew to play as. I addressed this earlier as it most likely being a way for Warzone players to keep using their skins, which again makes sense from a business standpoint. As someone who doesn't play with audio very much at all, it doesn't bother me and and the information still gets delivered through the comms device, although I totally understand the disappointment because we basically had a unique crew with personality since World War and it's jarring to have that taken away. Hopefully whatever game is next we will have some more consistent characters that the community is invested in even if we don't get a full crew. And the last big complaint that I saw was the lack of a second map to complement D Machine. This one is a lot harder to tackle because from a pure logistics standpoint I get why it didn't happen again. Only two years to make Cold War and a good chunk of that being during the pandemic really made Treyarch focus on just getting it done and working on time without getting extra resources to make extra stuff. But once again, as much as I do understand, Activision makes money hand over fist every single goddamn year and could have just brought in more resources to help out Treyarch. Even if for no other reason than Call of Duty was the biggest it had ever been at that point with Warzone dominating the gaming scene, 
give them more budget. Now the Cold War Zombies is launched, where does it go from here? Well, in a somewhat weird turn of events, after launch there was very little in terms of updates for the first month or so with only a few minor tweaks I mentioned like nerfing the ray gun or taking care of some bugs. Our first big update was a seasonal mode for zombies called Jingle Hells and I'm going to try to be kind to it but it was goofy as hell and no one really liked it. Basically what it did was add a few small decorations around the map, snowballs you could throw at zombies, snowmen which either gave you good or bad items, and a megaton flying in Santa's sleigh when you spawn. There are also presents that only draw from zombies frozen by the snowballs which when open can give you a variety of items. The problem with this mode though is that the main quest and all side quests are disabled plus armor and guns cost more salvage to upgrade. For anything other than a meme, there was absolutely no reason to play Jingle Hells. It took 6 weeks of waiting after launch to get this, and again I applaud them because the cosmetic changes were fun, but they were largely useless or even outright detrimental to the gameplay of zombies. Once Jingle Hells was over, it was once again mostly radio silence until the beginning of February where Cold War got its first post launch zombies map Firebase Z. In this map we're actually taken to Vietnam to tackle another outbreak of zombies at a Soviet military base that spread to the local villages. How did we get to Vietnam from Poland? Well that's where things get complicated. In some pre-launch trailers we saw a mysterious woman who looked strangely like a German girl we knew from the Ether storyline. Samantha Maxis is now an adult spy working for the Requiem Group which is a secret branch of the CIA tasked with figuring out these anomalies and you know trying to understand what the Dark Ether actually is. She's almost a rogue agent who reports back to Requiem whenever she sort of feels like it. Based on some intel she had received from a person within the Omega group who is the Soviet version of Requiem, Maxis headed to Vietnam. Her mission was to meet with this Omega member in a military base now run by the Soviets and meet with a few different people, but the main one being Dr. William Peck. He was an American trader who went to work for Omega and was close to unlocking the Dark Ether and its energy for themselves. Right before Maxis entered the base, her phone got tapped, he was captured, interrogated, and tortured by Peck. After refusing to give up her information, Peck said screw it and literally threw Maxis into the Dark Ether hoping that she would die and Requiem couldn't come save her. That's where the map begins with Requiem responding by sending in our strike team from D-Machine into Firebase Z or more specifically a village outside the base. I'm a big fan of this opening aesthetic because as I talked about a little while ago, Cold War made an effort to seem like it was part of a real world with people who weren't just soldiers or, you know, zombies to gun down endlessly. We may not see the civilians, but the laundry left hanging around, the food on the table, and the hints of their lives they lived here all made it feel a little more like higher stakes were going on. But back to gameplay, in the starting area there's a crafting table, pack punch machine, wonder foods machine, and armor station, which like, holy crap, that's a lot. When the game starts, they're all locked off thankfully, but still, it sort of feels like a custom map. You know, one of those custom maps where the creator just says, alright, I can't be bothered being creative with this and just puts all of the important things in one little area all right next to each other. After opening some doors, we're faced with the teleporter needed to take us into the actual facility. Once there, our players can take one of three routes around the map. I pretty much always go left and we're eventually met with an ethereum generator to turn on to turn on the power. I know I haven't mentioned it much, but ethereum is this universe's version of 115 where it can do just about anything seemingly. After you're done with that generator, there are two more to turn on and at about round 10 you'll start seeing items around the map appear and when walking up to them they'll transform into this weird zombie hybrid thing called a mimic. They run a bit faster than normal zombies and aren't as hard to kill as a megaton, but just god there is so many of them. In high rounds you'll be killing a good like two dozen of them around which is just too much. But in the beginning I think that they're fine. After a few more rounds an alarm will blare that an attack is coming and we need to go to the back side of one of the ethereum generators around the map. From back there three portals will form where zombies will flood out trying to attack the ethereum generator and turn it off. Bending off a few waves will end the round nice and easy though. Or at least for now. But next on our agenda should probably be the wonder weapon and for firebase z there's a new version of the ray gun called the ray k Four. This time it's actually in an assault rifle form where you can either shoot individual shots which are decently powerful or there's an option to shoot a big ball of energy which takes up 10 ammo. This ball on its own will kill some zombies and stun anything near it but it gets more powerful. Switching back to the automatic version of the gun and shooting the energy ball will cause an explosion that is much more powerful than either of the two modes on their own. Well I'm not really the biggest fan of the Ray Kion high rounds because it can be really clunky and easy 
easily kill you if your timing is slightly wrong. A lot of people really love this thing. So how do you actually get it? It's available in the mystery box. It can also be gotten from a legendary award from the challenge podium system or in a separate quest on its own. Honestly, I don't think I've ever done the quest for it because it just takes up too much time. Pretty much me and everyone else I know gets it from the challenge podium because the odds are quite good and the challenges themselves are really easy things that you can do well being on round six or seven anyway. Now that you've got all your perks and upgraded to Ray K, how are the high rounds? Well, you know those special rounds that I talked about? Starting in the mid 30s, I would say there is a new twist along with the zombies. A giant zombie abomination thing called an order spawns in and slowly makes its way towards you. It has a health bar that looks straight out of Elden Ring, but on launch the thing was genuinely a pushover, especially with Ring of Fire. But through a combination of making weapons deal less damage and giving it more health, nowadays this thing is way too powerful. Using a fully upgraded Ray K takes like 600 shots to kill it, and I barely had enough time to take it down before the generator was attacked. That's just too much. I like mid-game challenges in zombies normally, but this is an excessive overcorrection, especially considering the only downside of generators being taken is that you need to turn them back on the next round. If you're on round 100, 200, 300, there's no sense in defending it when you could just turn it back on the next round easier. What I will say though is that the Orda is really cool though, and I'm glad that we're finally getting large menacing enemies who are a real threat rather than sticking more zombies in armor and just calling it a day. There's another big problem with the Orda and this whole defending the generators gimmick. It just takes up so much of the map, like genuinely, more than half of the map's entire playable area is completely useless. If you're unfamiliar, the Orda defense areas are behind the generators and usually have some fortifications on them like any military base probably would. As a result of this, getting around is a little clunky and then there are three large paths that always lead to nowhere. Their entire purpose is to have portals spawn on them and be used for defense rounds. And because of, like I said, their clunky makeup and lack of proximity to anything useful, no one ever goes near them. When subtracting those areas from the map, Firebase Z is actually really small for a modern zombies map. This leads to a very cut and paste experience from one game to the next and with you needing the most powerful weapons to take down an order, you can't even play with anything more than a handful of guns for high round games. All of this is happening while simultaneously having that lack of difficulty which carried over from D Machine. There's a reason that Firebase Z was the first zombies map since World War had 24 zombies per round to have anyone reach round 1000 without cheating. It's such a strange mix of too difficult and not hard enough. To me, Firebase Z is Cold War at its absolute worst, with it boring me within a few days of launch and me going right back to playing D Machine or even other zombies games in the first week. We're not done with Firebase Z though, we still need to cover the main quest and save Maxis. This is where I get to properly introduce you to Maxis's initial contact in Omega and his name was Ravanov. He shut himself inside a room at spawn and after turning on power we go to speak to him. Then we speak to Peck who had himself also shut inside of a different room in the facility. I don't get why everyone's closing themselves off but whatever. Peck politely tells us to go away and then Ravanov gives us a key card to unlock a cabinet with some serum inside. Next to it is a chemical mixer and then we pick up this massive heavy machine to take with us. Since Peck didn't want to talk, our job is to place these chemicals on an air conditioning unit connected to Peck's room and gas him. This will actually make him hallucinate that his wife's there and he begins dancing by himself. Once he begins to realize what's going on, he'll beg for it to stop by deciding to help us and sending us to grab an essence collector. But here's where things get a little bit weird. The mimics actually used to be humans and now we need to collect them in this essence collector like it's Ghostbusters and scan their memories into a machine. That's if you can even catch the mimics though because for the first few days no one had any clue that specific mimics needed to be caught that were stationed around the map and we're just taking any of them that they could find. Once this step has been done though, two more times we need to do this and we're given a floppy disk where when placed inside of a computer, a door will open to a new room and a portal will spawn. Peck tells us to go away again and now it's time to look very closely at a bunch of small ethereum containers for the one of 20 that doesn't have black smoke inside. Next up, the canister needs to be shot with the Ray K's ball of energy to be caught and last, we just need to sit around for it for a while until it blows 
blows up. Finally, that means the new portal that just showed up is forced away. Realigning some satellites creates giant red beams, which looks cool admittedly, but we can make our way back to the portal because it came back again to save Maxis and then boss fight time. It's basically just another Ordo with barely any more health than a normal one. A prepared player can beat this in like 30 seconds, and this is probably the easiest boss fight in Zombies history up until that point. I don't really like Firebase Z all that much. I don't know if you could tell, but the general community sentiment was really positive at first. People were incredibly excited to have Maxis in the mix, especially because of her outfit. When leaving the Dark Aether, she had various items on for our iconic four premise characters from the Aether storyline. She had Nikolai's goggles on, Takeo's katana and gas mask, Monty's red scarf, and a similar watch to the one that Dempsey wears. This fueled so much speculation that Primus was going to make their return soon, or that Samantha was going to create a new crew and eventually mix in the Aether storyline. For the first time in the Dark Aether storyline, people were actually paying attention, and it was cool to see everyone finally get invested a bit. As far as gameplay, there was mostly a warm reception, and people thought Cold War was chugging along kind of nicely, even if it was taking a while to actually get content. Out. And then almost out of nowhere, things went absolutely mental. Firebase Z released on February 4th, and then exactly three weeks later, the world was introduced to the single most controversial thing in Zombies history known as Outbreak. This is a complete departure to anything Zombies had ever been. You're dropped into an open world region where there are small optional side quests to complete, zombies everywhere, bosses wandering the lands, and a main objective to complete. The scale of these was on one that we've never seen before, with Outbreak taking their regions from the multiplayer mode Fire Team. On launch, Outbreak had the region of Alpine, Duga, Golova, Ruka, and Sanatorium. Unlike previous Zombies game modes though, you weren't just stuck in the map that you loaded in on. After completing one of the rotating objectives, you then had the chance to power up and then move on to the next region where everything would get a little more tough. And later on in the game, some of these objectives would really test your skills. Defend required the players to find a machine, turn it on, and keep it protected while zombies were trying to break it apart. Retrieve had players taking small canisters of Ethereum that would slow your movement speed down over to a new area. Eliminate spawned in a harder boss zombie than usual, and it needed to be eliminated in three stages where they will retreat to different areas of the region. Secure made players kill zombies next to a rocket for collecting essence, transport was protecting a rover from the dark ether that needed to find its way back in, and lastly was holdout. This was always the hardest objective because you were forced into a small area where zombies and bosses rush at you constantly while a timer counts down to your escape. Some of these areas it could take you to were so brutally hard that it became an acceptable strategy to take it down and stay down so that you could bleed timer from the clock before reviving yourself. So essentially these maps and objectives would rotate as you played with there being more objectives than maps so you were always playing something a bit different. So essentially these maps and objectives would rotate as you played with there being more objectives than maps so you were always playing something a bit different. There were even first time innovations for zombies like vehicles to get around these giant maps, launch pads that allowed you to use a parachute that helped you glide over long distances, and walking to the map's edge would take characters to the world height to also parachute around. Outbreak was literally so different from everything COD Zombies had been for 12 years at that point. And clearly this combination of Firebase Z and Outbreak launching within 3 weeks of each other had drastically different playstyles and it went very well. Treyarch actually included in a blog post about a month after launch of Outbreak that it had achieved the highest number of current players that Zombies had ever seen. Not just in Cold War's year, that includes all other games. What an incredible achievement especially considering this was five months after launch and with pandemic lockdowns slowly lifting around the world, less people were inside playing games by the day. But Luke, you said this mode was wildly controversial. How is that possible if it was so successful? Well, I think it all has to do with the divide that I keep mentioning between the game's casual fans of Warzone and multiplayer versus enjoying the gameplay styles that Zombies fans have become to love. Because Zombies is such a drastic departure of what Zombies has always been with its decentralized progression, large maps filled with pockets of zombies like it was Dead Rising, and the already existing gripes of Cold War's gameplay changes, this was bound to boil over. It was almost certain that some hardcore zombies fans would take out all of their frustration as what they saw as a path of no return, where everything would continue to get worse. Even today in 2023, this is the most sensitive subject that people get very opinionated on when talking about zombies. 
there was almost a symbolic divide between what zombies was and what zombies will be going forward when Outbreak launched. And even though some of you may not be happy with this, I actually really like Outbreak and have since the beginning. I've always been of the opinion that Call of Duty Zombies being a wave-based survival mode is very limited in the creativity that it can achieve. There's only so much story that can be told and a small number of true gameplay changes that can be achieved while not entirely breaking that core progression. Treyarch accidentally put themselves in this box where maps need to be designed a certain way to keep the game fun and moving along. This in turn had a knock-on effect to the story's writing, new mechanics that can be introduced, and the general ways that they can innovate in general. But Outbreak broke that mold by keeping many things that players enjoyed about zombies like a round counter, perks, weapon upgrades, bosses, and cool quests to find treasure, while also making it open world and not tying the progression of the game to just killing a lot of zombies. If you really wanted to, there's a world where you don't need to kill any zombies in a region where you're given a holdout objective. It gives entirely new ways to play zombies that have never been attempted before and opens thousands of new doors to keep zombies innovating. With these doors open, maybe eventually zombies will strike it rich again, becoming the mainstream gaming darling that it was in the early 2010s. Where I will dock outbreaks and points though is not so much the fault of the game mode itself, but more of an external issue. Remember, Cold War was developed on an extremely tight schedule and with content expectations being higher than ever before, Treyarch was forced to work on a very tight schedule. And this includes after launch. Live development is the term for this and it essentially boils down to the developers making things for their game sometimes days before it goes out to the public. In an ideal world, they would have lots more time to be creative, bug test, and roll it out and have a healthy work schedule, but that's just not the case when live development isn't structured well and Cold Wars was not. That's mostly the fault of the pandemic and Activision needing to feed their CEO's endless obsession with money, but because Treyarch was working on their game as it went along on a tight schedule, it means that some things came out a bit half-baked or modes launched without not a lot of content on day one. Outbreak for all the praises that I give it was a little light on things to do for the first month or so before updates brought in a few more world events, objectives, regions, and main easter egg quest as we go along. Yes, if you go and play Outbreak now in 2023, it has two easter eggs and I'm just gonna say this, one of them has the best ending phase and boss fight that Treyarch has ever made. And so let's talk about that. The first of them was added on May 21st, which is three months after Outbreak launched and four months now since Firebase Z had released. That's kind of a yikes considering no other map came out in between that time, but we'll get to that in a bit. This first quest began with your team needing to kit themselves the hell out in the first few rounds of the game. This is because the quest can't actually begin until round three. I'm assuming that decision was made to have a bit of difficulty in killing zombies and not just making the whole thing a cakewalk. Once round three begins, you'll need to find a radio which will give off a specific static noise. Match that noise to one of the three amplifiers hidden in the area and repeat until all of them are done. When you're done interacting with the main radio again, it will drop some points and a beacon listening device spawns in to pick up. Finishing out the main objective for round three and head to the beacon like normal to go to the next region. Region. But when you're going up to the beacon itself this time, you can attach the listening device and Maxis will begin to speak and we need to respond. She'll take us to the next region where we need to find a monkey bomb with an M symbol written next to it. Shooting it will drop a film reel and taking this film reel to a projector will show us some pictures explaining what's actually going on. The quick version of what she said is that Omega has a plan to take one of the crystal beings from the dark ether, make it massive, strap it to the rocket headed for the United States, and create outbreak zones which would probably kill everyone in the country. Requiem has also been keeping it a secret from everyone, but with Maxis's intel, it's now our job to stop it by tracking down Rabinov. The next region you now enter is guaranteed to be Ruka, which has an an elevator that used to be closed off before but now it's blown open and riding the elevator down takes us to a group of missile silos. Once inside you'll stumble around for a little while until finding a computer which will end the area's lockdown procedure and bring the lights up. Now begins a cutscene which we really haven't seen in Cold War so far and it involved Ravanov killing some Russian guards and deciding that once the keys are secured for these missiles that they will be launched into the Pacific Ocean. When the cutscene is done things get serious because now a ton of mimics spawn along with the normal zombies while trying to find three launch keys. Finding the first of these keys spawns a harder mimic who when killed will drop the first one. The second key is found by collecting ethereum crystals around the silos and bringing them to a harvesting unit. 
When that's full, pick it up and bring it to another silo where there is this huge dark ether jellyfish floating around. Going up some stairs and activating the field upgrade that the harvesting unit gave you will make the jellyfish grab the player and drop you down through its body. As this is going on, you'll need to grab a key that's also floating inside the jellyfish. The third key is just so funny and stupid because someone will need to go find an essence trap like Firebay Z with a banana attached to it. There will also now be a ghost monkey that spawns in and you need to throw the essence trap close enough to the monkey where he'll see the banana walk into the essence trap and close it over. Our monkey friend apparently had the third key that we needed. I think this is probably one of the most random steps in an easter egg that zombies has ever had because we need some henna tentacle monsters and and some ghost monkey chasing a banana. I'm not complaining, I just found them very funny and random. Anyway, now it's time to launch the missiles and we need to use a key on each of the three different launch panels. The order that you do this in is randomized, which sucks because it prolongs how long you're in the silo, just draining your ammo and your armor and general resources, but whatever. Eventually, when you do get it right, it's time to head back outside where the boss fight will begin. You'll only have nine minutes to complete it or your game is over and the Legion boss fight is difficult. All kinds of different mini bosses and zombies will be spawning in around you while the legion is trying to kill you. Shooting it in the chest enough will cause it to teleport and then spawn in three small orbs of energy near it. Taking down one of the orbs, which is really difficult to do by the way, will take away a third of the legion's health. Without having good guns to do this, combined with ring of fire for damage boost and having every player shoot at the same orb at the same time, you'll probably struggle to finish a lot of this in time. Repeat that process two more times of taking out the orbs of the legion, adding in a different, you know, way to kill you every single time and the quest has been completed. I'm kind of understating just how hard this boss fight actually is though. Asking anyone who's ever played zombies will say this is by far the hardest boss fight ever made because you're battling the zombies, mini bosses, timer, legion, and your own teammates to get it done. Solo players have it even more rough needing to have enough coordination to keep zombies far enough away while doing damage to the legion and getting through these phases in 9 minutes. There's also no armor stations or crafting tables in the boss fight fight area, meaning that once your armor is gone, the only way to get it back is an armor plate drop or armor vest. Same thing with self revives, which makes it brutally hard, especially if you're doing challenge runs and not really using the most powerful high damage per second weapons, or god forbid you're doing this on a round higher than 5 or 6. Getting back on track though, even though the boss fight is completed, there's another cutscene where the missiles launch and the helicopter comes to take us back. Base. It's basic, but I appreciate it over not having one at all. I've said this before though, but I love that boss fight and that easter egg in general once you enter the silo just for having the balls to make a boss fight difficult. That's something I think they've strayed away from in the past where you could basically enter some boss fights with 3 magazines of ammo and no secondary, but really complete easily. With the Legion though, you and everyone else needs to be stacked or you will be screwed over. No two ways about it, you can't just stall out the time and spend 20 minutes chipping away damage. Like not, nah, either you kill the boss or it kills you, simple as that. And in my opinion, Treyarch needs to keep going in that direction. Make quests more challenging and give them as a Destiny style raid progression where it goes through stages that require puzzle solving along with killing lots of bosses before you inevitably run into the big final boss who could wipe you out. I don't care if the rest of zombies is easy all that much, but damn it make my bosses hard and fair like the Legion because it almost seems as if people agreed with me since the feedback I saw in release was pretty overwhelmingly positive towards it. There's still challenge runs to this day that content creators are doing for the Legion, and I remember there was a small speedrun hype for it for the first week or so that was really nice to see. Granted, this easter egg did launch way too late, because this took 3 months after Outbreak launched to get added, and there was no other zombies maps released to supplement in between, so that kinda sucks, but as I said, Treyarch's insane workload was probably taking its toll at that point. Then suddenly, in a repeat of what happened a few months prior, once this easter egg released, only 3 weeks later Treyarch dropped in another one. Granted this one was shorter and I think is probably the weakest main quest in a zombies game so far, but hey it's content. Just like the first easter egg, it begins on round 3 where red rift portals will spawn around the map on whichever region you're in. Once you jump in, it will take you to world height and now you need to very quickly find another portal floating in the sky and glide into that one. Do this two more times with each portal getting a little further away. After that's done, you'll see something fall out of the sky and following it down will give you another beacon listening device. Progressing to the next round will bring the player to Sanatorium where you need to find a crashed helicopter and kill some mini bosses. 
When done, an audio recording will play from the Omega Group. Progressing to the next round will bring the player to Sanatorium where you need to find a crashed helicopter and kill some mini bosses. When done, play an audio recording from the Omega Group and a scientist explains will need to find an ethereal orb. After being found, shoot it and follow it, shoot it again, and eventually it will go to a bridge where there is a rover capable of going into the dark ether. The orb apparently refuses to go inside of the rover unless it has a toy bunny given to it whatever to just go find a mystery box location and take it to the orb who is now satisfied. The orb then has a seizure and the rover now moves as we are stuck inside of a moving bubble that gets swarmed by zombies and megatons as it slowly moves towards the monument area which was cut off until now. I will say that the outside area is really cool because there's lots of dark ether jellyfish just kind of vibing around. Once we're at the monument we'll find a bunch of dead scientists who had been executed by Omega right before we got there. Some dipshit named Jaeger brags about how he tricked us and is one step ahead and he's glad this is the end for us. Now the boss fight starts and it's really quite lame. You pretty much just need to kill 50 total enemies that spawned in including an Orta and a Panzer or two. With score streaks this is painfully easy and not even really worth talking about. What is worth talking about though is the ending cutscene where Omega actually shoots down our helicopter and big bad dude from the campaign, Krebchenko shows up to take everyone hostage. Gotta be honest, I don't think any of us expected a twist like that from a crappy easter egg that was solved in like two hours by the community. This was really the weakest piece of content zombies had seen in a long time and the community sentiment around it was just really bad in general. Pretty much everyone I saw on Twitter or YouTube was talking about how they were generally disappointed. But I think much of the frustration at this point wasn't just because that one easter egg wasn't great, but it was because Outbreak had overstayed its welcome a little bit. Since the end of February, we've only really had content releasing for Outbreak and now in the middle of June, people were starting to get worried. There are only two traditional round based maps in the game at this point and it appears as if we were only going to get one more map and the bulk of the development for the rest of the year was going to go to just Outbreak. It was worrying even for people who enjoyed Outbreak because round based zombies is just so good and that's what many of us hardcore fans were expecting after so long. You could almost feel the tension in conversations around zombies and this was around the time where a lot of YouTubers began to get negative about Cold War, calling it a lost year or zombies had lost its way. Well, we only need to wait another month because on July 16th, we went back to round based with Mauer der Toten, a map near the Berlin Wall. Mauer is actually a bit of a weird map with it having a lot of layers of verticality, but not in a way that becomes too much. You start out on a rooftop in Berlin and once a door is opened, you'll need to zip line across to another building. Opening most doors in general on this map leads to more zip lines or sometimes a big staircase. Even getting to some crafting tables and the Wonder Fizz machine requires zip lines to enter buildings which are literally 50 feet away from each other. As much as I do and don't complain about it though, I really love Mauer a lot. The atmosphere being nighttime and the rain is way different than any zombies maps that we've had before and some really cool areas like the underground subway were added. Because once you've gotten off of the big buildings and you reach a street level, you can now go underground and use a flashlight to navigate around so you can turn on the power. Also, you'll now need to be on the outlook for a fast moving train that is on fire and filled with zombies that will run you over. There's also the boy himself, Klaus, who is a robot created by Requiem, who was also a spy somehow. He also has a fabulous pink mohawk and a curly mustache drawn on in Sharpie. But you'll need to build him by gathering a battery, finding some robot hands off of a dead guy, and getting a microwave dish by digging a little bit. Klaus isn't just built for being cool though, he's actually kind of useful. He's actually needed for some easter egg steps and is also required for a free wonder weapon side quest and some other general things around the map. Speaking of the wonder weapon, for Mauer, it is the brand new Cerberus which is a futuristic looking pistol which has a spinning ball of energy constantly rotating around it. The gun itself will shoot an energy blast but also so will the ball and at first that was really disorientating but I loved it anyway. There are also three upgrades for the Cerberus that require basically no steps to get each of them. Oh, and also the Cerberus is available from the Trials Machine just like in any other Cold War map and that's how I really get it. All you need to do for each of the upgrades is to kill zombies and wait for them to drop a new weapon kit crystal these crystals can be any of the three upgrades. Those of which are the Swarm, which shoots a tiny spinny cluster of energy but doesn't have too much ammo. There's the Blazer upgrade, which looks like a harpoon gun and fires continuous laser shot in a straight line. Lastly is the Diffuser, which shoots a lot of shots in a wide area, kind of like a shotgun, and they're all quite cool, but spoiler, none of them are that good aside from the base version of the Cerberus. Then we've got something that Mauer is actually known for, and it's the main quest, Easter Egg. I've already basically gone over the first few steps, like needing Klaus or to get the Cerberus, 
Cerberus, so let's skip to the next one. We're going to need Klaus's headgear, which can be done by shooting various objects around the map, like a radio antenna and, you know, shooting some radios and picking up the part that they drop. Once done, Klaus needs to be upgraded so he can punch a wall and we can use the laser variant of the Cerberus to melt a wall, revealing a hidden laboratory. Inside the laboratory, we need to collect three canisters and an essence trap like in Firebase Z again. Around the map at the same time, three essence harvesters will spawn. Placing a canister into the harvester and throwing your essence trap on top of the machine will spawn in Tempest. They're basically small versions of the big boss from Outbreak. Killing them near the harvesters will collect their souls, take the canister to the laboratory, place it down, and repeat the harvester step two more times. Now it's back to Klaus in his femboy arc where he needs to flip a switch on a subway control board and you need to command Klaus to stand on the track. Klaus will be able to actually hold back the train so you can jump inside of it, collect a bomb and key card. Place the bomb inside of the lab and use the key card on a computer where eventually it will activate a satellite. This satellite will fire a beam of energy that spawns in a ton of mini bosses for us to kill. One of those being a super megaton who when killed will drop two pieces of of uranium. Taking the uranium to an old military tent will allow us to craft a new device to hold the uranium. Now run as quickly as possible to a specific zip line on top of one of the buildings and place it on there. Repeat this for the second piece of uranium, but take it to the other side of the same zip line. Doing this will have the two pieces collide and create a new purified rock where we can place inside of the labs once again. And in a move I really don't like, you need to repeat this whole satellite and uranium process before going to the next step, which is actually the boss fight. Sorry if you guys could hear that, by the way, that was my food being delivered for dinner. But anyway, our boss fight for this map is actually a woman called Valentina, who is the daughter of a Nazi scientist named Vogel, who is the head of the facility at D Machine. He had escaped into the dark ether before World War II ended and the Russians found the facility. Valentina, still in the real world, took on a new identity and became a member of the Russian group Omega. She began having dreams of her father that told her to find the labs underneath Berlin, and there she became convinced she could create a fourth Reich and crossed over into the Dark Ether universe herself. Inside, she reunited with her father, and he used his research to transform her into something resembling a tempest with red crystals covering her whole body, making her no longer human. Only then, she begins to realize that this man may not actually actually be her father. Back to the boss fight for now, the boss fight begins with Valentina revealing her intentions to all groups involved and taking her metaphorical throne. We begin in the bunker where she'll have a protective bubble that we need to blast open and begin damaging her. Zombies will begin to flood from the portal and Valentina will begin teleporting to different areas of the map and fighting back against us with a crystal shard attack. About halfway through the fight, she gains a new attack of creating a big energy burst that kills anyone too close. In a last ditch attempt to win, she teleports back to the lab and tries another larger wipe attack before going bye bye The boss fight ends and a cutscene begins with us strapping Valentina to a device as she starts telling us that someone named the Forsaken is coming to consume our world. Hitting a button on the machine shuts her up by making her go into an ethereum crystal inside of the warhead that we had created. But because we can't take the bomb into the dark ether without dying ourselves, Klaus actually shows up and volunteers to do it himself and now we need to defend Klaus. Zombies and bosses begin flooding from the portal and after about 30 seconds Klaus is finally inside. Bang, off goes the bomb in the dark ether and the portal is closed. In return for helping kill Valentina, Kravchenko returns Raptor 1, the helicopter pilot, to us after he was kidnapped during the ending of the second outbreak main quest. Well, never mind actually, it was a trap and Kravchenko is trying to kill us on our way out of Berlin. Suddenly when all hope seems lost, Weaver tells Samantha to open a portal that we jump through to safety. Yeah, so Sam has ethereal powers and since since we got her back, she's been held at the Requiem facility to try and train those powers. The man overseeing Requiem is a mysterious figure known as the Director who we only catch in a little glimpse as of now and I kind of wonder why he looks so familiar. But before we wrap up zombies with the last map Forsaken, let's talk about the other zombies content in Cold War. Let's begin with the one year PlayStation exclusive mode of Onslaught. On day one, Onslaught was painfully thin on content actually. The basic idea of it was that you were spawned in on a multiplayer map and there was a ball of ethereal energy. That ball created a bubble that you need to play inside and it moves around after each round. Unlike normal zombies though, you progress by filling up a meter to 100. Bosses and hellhounds produce more energy than basic zombies and the overall amount of energy each of those types gives off goes down each round. By just about round 30, a zombie will only provide one energy towards the meter but a hellhound will provide three. 
After every 5 rounds or so, there will be a boss that spawns from the energy orb and they have a lot of health. All of that sounds kind of fun, and it was until about round 10 when you realize the zombies continue to increase in health, but no way to increase your own damage output. The only way of obtaining perks was by getting them one at a time from the boss rounds, and there was no way to upgrade your weapons at all besides grabbing a weapon that could drop from the bosses. Only one level of armor that basically evaporates in 3 hits is all you're going to get, and just generally speaking, Onslaught on launch was probably the hardest mode Treyarch has created in a long time. Your only way of killing in the late game was with tomahawks that you can pick up from enemies that you killed with them, your ring of fire field upgrade, or the occasional plague hound kill with a gun. Progression was incredibly slow and overall it really kept the high rounds away and just people didn't really want to play it, especially with it being a PlayStation exclusive for the first year. That was until almost out of nowhere it got a complete revamp. The core systems were the same for it but with so many quality of of life edition. There was now a way to upgrade your weapon's rarity with ether wrenches, pack punching was also added via the various colored uh, chalices that would upgrade your gun one, two, or three times. Same with armor because you can now get vests that give more than one bar of health. Zombies weren't as oppressively in your face all the time and there was more plague hounds to speed up the rounds. The general loot you received was much better as well and if used appropriately it would get you from one boss wave to the next. These things may not seem like a big difference but it really felt massive and took Onslaught from being a mode I never really played very often because it was so difficult to being the most chilled out version of zombies probably ever made. All you need to worry about is killing zombies and getting to round 40 only takes like 30 minutes. No setup required, no steps to complete, it's great actually. Off the back of these additions, there was also side modes that began to get added to Onslaught shortly after this. The most famous of them being Onslaught Containment, which had to be the easiest zombies mode ever released. You were basically playing on smaller gunfight maps from multiplayer, and unlike every other version of zombies in this game, there were no super sprinters. In fact, the zombies barely spawned in at all. Rarely would you ever have more than a few zombies nearby, and with players finally discovering that the Howard shotgun combined with a task force barrel shreds everything, it became a joke. Boss rounds lasted for no exaggeration 2 seconds if you used a death machine plus a ring of fire. I played containment on day 1 and reached round 325 without ever going below half health the entire game. The only reason I didn't go to a higher round was because the game servers disconnected. Despite that I did have fun and I do believe that eventually this issue was solved and containment is still easy but not as easy as it once was. And the last side mode to cover is Dead Ops Arcade 3, which I will fully admit I am no expert at whatsoever on any form of Dead Ops. I have played each version but never learned any of the intricacies of them because I'm usually only worried about working on the main round base maps. Despite that, I did find time during the year to play Dead Ops Arcade 3 because it was really good actually and I'm a huge fan of some of the new features. The wild area was incredible to see for the first time and personally would have loved to see it have its own survival map just because it's so ridiculous. There's flaming shooting arrows at you while you try to avoid the giant elephant boss from Black Ops 4, there's an area that looks like Temple Run, there's a random maze filled with zombies and all kinds of other wacky stuff which all made Dead Ops 3 feel really unique. The core gameplay of most of the rounds is the same with it being mostly a top down endless shooter arcade game but the additions this time made me enjoy it much more. Also, I love first person dead ops really fun. But now we can get back to the main maps and the last one that we need to cover is Forsaken and let's quickly go over the background of Cold War's story that's been mostly going on within the intel system. Back in D-Machine we learned of a man named Zykov who was a Russian soldier volunteered to enter the Dark Aether in an attempt to close the portals. It was a mission he was not meant to return from because the door he entered through was welded shut behind him. Turns out Zykov was alive in there all these years and was able to establish contact with both Requiem and Omega. His the promise was that if we got him out then he would help us to defeat the Forsaken, a monster who's become so powerful he could devastate our entire world in a matter of hours. Omega has already been working on rescuing Zykov at a facility in Ukraine where they want to also capture the Forsaken and use it as a weapon. A special portal was made for this exact reason and it was waiting to be activated. Kravchenko and Peck were already on site trying to get the portal activated. That's where we come in. Maxis creates a portal for us to enter the area without the loud noises of a helicopter to alert Omega. 
Our game begins and it's basically a parking lot outside of the giant pyramid itself. There's another portal that we activate to enter the facility proper, but this area also acts similarly to the no man's land from Moon. The first 10 rounds all pass on a timer, not by killing certain amounts of zombies. Starting on round 11 though, things play out normally and I really enjoyed this because it's a new play on an old gimmick without making it too brokenly overpowered. You'll also usually not exit the spawn area until round 7 or 8, which means when entering the pyramid zombies will be a little bit quicker and spawn in more frequently and you'll have some points. This is really good since Forsaken's first real area is somewhat big and more open than we're really used to. There's a lot of scaffolding, there's juggernaut, and just, you know, the opening area is very big. Even though this is all reused campaign assets, I really enjoyed the hokey ass burger shops and the surfboard sellers that were in the area and it brings a much different vibe to zombies than the creepy World War II area bunkers of old. But anyway, on your left when entering this new area is a restaurant to buy stamina and the on the right there's one for quicker vibe going up the stairs in the back takes us up to a new portal when taken we arrive at the other side of the forsaken facility which is another pseudo american town in this one i love so much that there's this blockbuster looking store and bubby the fat fry cook gets his yearly reference in call of duty but once we get to the end of this area there's another portal we need to build using pieces from the adjacent buildings when this portal is built we go to another area which looks very similar to the kgb headquarters from the campaign Walking a bit reveals this giant ethereum energy highway of pipes, taking it to all I would assume is the special portal? That's never really made too clear to be honest, but at the end of this hallway there's another less powerful portal that this time when you approach it pops out a new boss called an abomination. It's a three-headed dog looking thing which kind of looks like the Margwa from Black Ops 3. He works slightly different this time around but in effect is the same besides it having a big mouth laser which can hurt a lot and needs to be damaged with the mouth being open. You can damage it when the mouth is closed but it basically does almost nothing. Once the abomination is killed we teleport right up to the observation tower in the middle of the entire facility. We get there just after Peck and Kravchenko started the process to get Zykov from the Dark Aether and a cutscene begins. Zykov exits the Dark Aether, thanks us for saving him, and pulls off his gas mask to reveal that he's actually the Forsaken. He goes on to explain in his new form that in the Dark Aether he evolved and consumed his way into this monster because he was abandoned. Kravchenko actually blames Peck for this deceit and slaps him to the ground. Zombies storm the observation tower and one of the bullets that they fire hits the gas line in there, causing a massive explosion, presumably taking out both of them. Maxis then teleports in against Weaver's orders and begins to fight the Forsaken using her own ethereal powers. Back to the gameplay, to get to that point in the story, we needed to have acquired the map's wonder weapon, the Chrysalak. As normal with Cold War, it can be obtained through the Trials Machine, the Mystery Box, or a side quest. This is also probably a top 5 wonder weapon ever in my opinion. It's basically a bunch of ethereum crystals stuck together in the shape of an axe. You swing it around like crazy as a melee weapon and it's actually a one-shot kill up until the last round or two of zombies still increasing in health. The Chrysalax is an absolute beast against bosses too, making it so much fun to play with and blast through low rounds. If regular guns are more of your style though, don't worry, it does that too because the crystal axe can transform into an SMG that shoots crystals at the zombies. It's shot for shot, not as powerful as the melee, but still really good, especially on faraway mini bosses. I'm a big fan of this thing, and I will still say that if it had appeared first in Black Ops 2 or Black Ops 3, then the community would definitely say it's the best designed wonder weapon ever. Now that we have the Crystal Axe in the first cutscene we already talked about is done, the next step of the main quest is to do a holdout at the fuel processing area. When finished, a fuel tank will drop down for us to pick up. The next step is where some large crystals appear in three areas of the map with little orbs flying around them. Using the SMG part of the Crystal Axe to shoot the orbs, and then the melee portion of it to slice open the big crystal itself will show us some crystal shards. Now we need an abomination to appear so we can throw the shard into its mouth and then kill it dropping another new shard. Repeat this two more times while using the abomination in the KGB office area to knock down a housing unit by charging at a wall. Our next step is to get dead wire on one of the weapons and have it activate by shooting a zombie next to an arcade cabinet and having it activate called the Grand Prix. The electricity will arc to the machine turning it on and now we can spend 2000 points to attach one of of our crystals to a real RC car. Inside of that RC car, we need to drive it into a building next to us, go into a vent, and cause an explosion to break open a wall. This will show us the last piece that we need to build an ethereum neutralizer which should close all the portals and contain the forsaken. When we're ready to enter the boss fight, the neutralizer will begin making its way towards the boss arena. 
Once inside, our character and Maxis will begin assisting each other to take down the Forsaken. We need to shoot out his shields and after a few attacks from the Forsaken, Maxis will say she needs a charge. Killing zombies near her will allow their ethereal energy to transfer to her and she can transfer that to a railgun looking thing so that we can shoot the Forsaken. Doing this one more time and taking him to half health will begin a mini sequence where the Forsaken tries to trick us into thinking Maxis will betray us and kill everyone. His way of doing this is showing a blacked out reality with only a wall reminiscent of Mob of the Dead where in blood it's carved no one escapes alive. When we obviously reject his delusions, we enter back into the boss fight where he's now got a few more attacks. Do the cannon step two more times and the boss fight is done. In the middle of the room during the fight, there was a giant metal containment vice that Omega had created that looks not at all identical to the one Sophia was back in during Black Ops 3 and Black Ops 4, but this containment device begins to suck in the Forsaken once he's defeated and we need to survive until he's absorbed and the cutscene begins. Maxis knows that she's the last hope to finish the fight and so she apologizes to Weaver because she knows what happens next. The Forsaken isn't weak enough yet to fully be contained so she flies into the dark ether destroying all of the gateways inside. Trapping herself in the dark ether and making sure that the Forsaken has nowhere to draw more power from making sure that it can actually be contained. The cutscene continues with us seeing outbreak zones close around the world and Weaver thanking Sam for her sacrifice. Helicopters come in to take away the containment device and soon after this all of the members of Strike Team and the leadership of Requiem were arrested underneath the direct leadership of the director. All of them know where way too much, so they were taken away to a presumably prison somewhere that no one would ever find them in the middle of the mountains. Now that everything was dealt with, Project Janus could begin, a secret project that the US government leadership and Requiem and some weird other group were working on all at the same time. At the last second, we actually see the director watching everyone be arrested. He stands up, picks up his briefcase, and begins to leave. He stops, turns around, and we see clearly for the first time in the Dark Ether story, Edward Richtofen. We're not done yet though, because cut to five years later, we see a man walking into a fishing hut in Japan. He asks a local fisherman to rent a boat and points to a remote area of the ocean where, once upon a time, Zetsubo no Shimo is located. This is also where the missiles were sent during the first Outbreak main quest. The fisherman looks at him with confusion and asks why he wants to go there. Our mysterious man pulls back his hood to reveal a deeply scarred Dr. Peck saying he wants to see some old friends. That is where Cold War Zombies ends and I thought that was a great way to actually end the year. Forsaken may not be a top 10 map ever made for most people, but I think it was a solid enough map that was mostly used to deliver the story beats that will live much longer in the memory than the map itself. This is where our first year of the Dark Ether storyline ends and unlike other times where Treyarch has done this like with Revelations, I actually felt satisfied because we learned something. There wasn't this crushing sadness like there was after Black Ops 3 or Black Ops 4, but there's actually some hope that things are going to get more interesting and hey, like we actually have something to look forward to. That's why believe it or not, before Vanguard came out, there was a massive level of hype from what I remember seeing, you know, hey, what's the next iteration of what Treyarch is doing going to be? You know, are we going to do a prequel? How are they going to follow this all up? That's why everyone was so excited for Vanguard, because if it was the same quality as Cold War and kept the narrative going, then heck yeah, but that didn't really happen. As a final wrap up, just let me say this. Zombies in 2023 is not the same zombies it was in 2010 or 2016 because it can't be. With Black Ops 4 being a financial failure, Zombies needed to be retooled to stay a viable game mode in the future that Activision can't see as expendable. Those changes were not for everyone and shifted gears to being a much more casual focused experience with a slowly emerging story at the beginning. The gameplay was mechanically some of the best and most streamlined we have ever seen, but it is different than Zombies in the past. As the year went on though, you could see some of the old Treyarch coming out. More crazy, wacky ideas mixed with the grounded experience that they had built before launch. And that gives me a lot of hope that in 2024, we can have some of the best of both worlds. In order to make sure that people love zombies more than ever before, Cold War was a different and controversial step, but I don't think it's all bad. There was some good to come out of it. And for a certain number of players, it created the best zombies experience ever, for others who have been around for so long with zombies, it really felt like they got alienated. Thanks for watching all the way through. Make sure to like on your way out and watch some of my other Call of Duty retrospective videos popping up on the screen right now. I've done Black Ops 2, Black Ops 3, and Vanguard.